I'm Ted Doby, an editor for the journal Neuron, here with Kevin Tracy, professor and president of the Feinstein Institute. Thanks for joining me, Kevin. Thanks for having me, Ted. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, so about 25 years ago, there was, a, there was a revolution in neuroimmunology where you contributed to the discovery that the nervous system talks to the immune system through the inflammatory reflex. Can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind uh, why you decided to study this? I am a, a neurosurgeon by training, mm -hmm. and I became fascinated by uh, inflammation during the course of my training after a, a patient I took care of suffered from a severe case of, of, of sepsis, of systemic inflammation. And it would, be nice, it would be a real nice story to say that because I was a neurosurgeon thinking about the nervous system and now uh, a scientist thinking about inflammation that, that, that I decided to put these two things together on purpose. But what actually happened came about, like a lot of good lab stories, it came about uh, through serendipity. Um, we were working on a molecule that we had developed to block inflammation. And this molecule, when we put it in the brains of animals with a stroke, uh, which of course induces inflammation around the ischemic penumbra, that this molecule in the brain stopped, stopped the production of cytokines in the brain, which is what we expected. What we didn't expect is that it would also s switch off inflammation in the, in the peripheral immune system. And that, that launched us down a, 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 the, a, the last 25 years of work pursuing a, a mechanistic understanding of how signals traveling in the vagus nerve can, can modulate the immune system in the body. So, you just mentioned the vagus nerve. So now vagus nerve stimulation is indi in indicated for a number of uh, indications approved by the FDA mm -hmm. for a number of things. It's in the pipeline for a number of things. Could you have imagined how many uh, different conditions could have been treated by vagus nerve stimulation? Well, once yes, once we realized the fundamental role that signals in the vagus nerve have in controlling the magnitude of the inflammatory response, the magnitude of cytokine storm. Once we understood those mechanisms, we realized that because inflammation is either a major factor in, or a cause of, or a contributing factor in the major unsolved um, diseases of the human race, mm -hmm. we, we, yes, for many years we've been thinking this, this could be a really, really important path to pursue. You know, it's very gratifying to see the, the interest in this now. I mean, I think this, this field of neuroimmunology is one of the hottest areas in all of science. I mean, you have, you have an enormous field of neuroscience, you have an enormous field of, of immunology, and, they're, and they're, they're intersecting now in a very powerful way. And what, so that's very gratifying. The other thing that really has me excited is the, the, debil the ability is with, with tremendous advances in, in tools from Silicon Valley we, and from biomedical engineering, we, we have the, in our fingertips now, we have the ability to do things to control molecular and neural networks that just was not imaginable 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, you alluded to something very, very important when you started. You, you pointed out the fact that the FDA has, has already approved vagus nerve mm -hmm. stimulation. That's for epilepsy and depression, primarily. Those are the two biggest indications mm -hmm. now in the world. But what many people don't realize is that happened a long time ago. Yeah. So we have decades of experience with vagus nerve stimulation therapy in uh, patients. And, and the, the, we know, uh, essentially, the safety profile of vagus nerve stimulation. It is, uh, it's, a, it's a very feasible, uh, relatively safe, um, some might say minor surgery to do this, and um, if in fact these devices prove to be efficacious in diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease, the, the, the risk-benefit ratio is, is going to be comparing a device implanted once for life mm -hmm. uh, safely uh, as opposed to the use of Drugs that cost $100,000 a year have to be given invasively, they have mm -hmm. to be injected, and they have black box warnings, which means their side effects are so serious. It's the most serious warning label the FDA, FDA can give. So it's going to be a fascinating time to see the adoption of vagus nerve therapy instead of these other drugs with black box warnings if the FDA approval occurs 
for rheumatoid arthritis, which, which may happen in the coming year or so. Mm -hmm. So you touched a little bit on the, the technological advances that have kind of allowed this field to flourish. What do you think the field still needs to work on to, to you know, increase efficacy or accessibility of these sorts of treatments? As, as, uh, as you know, in, in, in your business, editing, editing journals, for every important discovery, there's a thousand more questions, and that's absolutely the case in this, uh, in this burgeoning, blossoming field of neuroimmunology. So if you break it down in, into component parts, you know, you have the motor or efferent signals from the brain that travel to the immune system, and we've learned a tremendous amount about that. You could argue, argue we know more about the mechanisms of that inflammatory reflex motor pathway than we do about some drugs. But there's two other com big components um, that, are, that are not as far along in our, in our research mechanis me mechanistic understanding. On the afferent or sensory side, we're just beginning to understand how the information traveling up the vagus nerve about the presence of infection or inflammation or ischemia in the body, how is, how is the vagus nerve processing that or delivering it um, to the brain, and, and how, how is specificity and sort of a separation of, of cause and kind maintained in the nervous, because it must be. That's how mm -hmm. the nervous system works. And then the third area, so you get motor and sensory, the third area is the central integration right. component in the brain. And now what we're talking about is how does the brain work? Yeah. Um, and there's been some tremendously important advances from Aza Rose's lab in Israel, from Jeff Friedman's lab and, and Charles Zucker's lab, mm -hmm. both in New York. Um, amazingly important work showing that using modern molecular genetic techniques you can map neural networks in the brain and and show how the how the closed uh, closed loop systems are working the sensory signals come in they're processed by networks in the brain stem and then the signals come back down so every one of those components of this story yep. uh, uh, offers a, another uh, opportunity to intervene therapeutically right. with either devices that target a specific input or output or processing center. I mean, millions of people have deep brain stimulators implanted already. That's true. Yeah. And these, many of these mechanisms are also going to be accessible to new to new drugs. Mm -hmm. It's not just a device story. So that's 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 those are those are really important um, opportunities now for more research. Right. So so you see see a time where there's kind of anatomical specificity or cell type specificity where, you know, for example, for a metabolic disorder, you could target, you know, specific um, afferents or efferents or, 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 you know, the molecules involved in those signaling pathways versus, say, rheumatoid arthritis or, you know, some other indication. Absolutely. So right now, the devices that are being um, tested, in fact, recently, um, a, a clinical trial just closed. Uh, it was done by a company that I co that I co-founded, Setpoint Medical, and, and they studied about 200 patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And that, their, that approach is to put a, a stimulating um, device on the vagus nerve and send in a very l small amount of current. Because it's a small amount of current, mm -hmm. you're only activating a, probably a few thousand fibers that of the 100,000 yep. um, that are, appear to be sufficient to turn off inflammation and to give therapeutic benefit to patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So that's one strategy. Another strategy is to hone in on features of individual fibers that are either selectively afferent or selectively efferent that have a defined functional Mm -hmm. molecular role. And in, in those devices are under um, development. They're not widely available, but there are ways to, to do that, so, to do selective stimulation that are being pursued. And then there's the pharmacological approach. Yeah. So is there, is there, um, op are there opportunities for kind of closed loop systems, you know, AI detection of events, or, or how, how do we determine like the correct stimulation parameters? So, the correct stimulation parameters currently are being determined the same way you determine the correct dose of a drug. Yep. Does it work? Yep. Uh, is it efficacious? Have clinical trials been, ro you know, robust clinical trials, have they been randomized properly? Have they been statistically um, set up statistic correctly uh, from all points of view of statistics and enrollment and patient allocation? So, the good old-fashioned answer is you start 
and, and design a therapy and see if it works in a, in a clinical way. The, the, the holy grail long term mm -hmm. would be to have a personalized therapy yeah. where the device would be closed loop with feedback that was specific to that person. We're not there yet. Yeah. That's a long ways off. Um, you can make a very strong argument back to what we talked about a few minutes ago that in the risk benefit analysis, if you have a device that works in some percentage of patients that is safe, mm -hmm. um, that that's a good start. Yeah. And what will come uh, in the future, referring back again to your, to your earlier question, what, what's going to be necessary going forward is we're going to have to do a lot more clinical trials. Yeah. You know, I envision that the devices will be approved for the early indications, mm -hmm. um, hopefully rheumatoid arthritis, uh, perhaps um, inflammatory bowel disease, maybe one day multiple sclerosis. And as the uh, idea becomes adopted into clinical practice, mm -hmm. this will accelerate two things. The patient demand, yeah. who, patients who don't want to take drugs with black box warnings that mm -hmm. it costs $100,000 a year by injection. Mm -hmm. So the patient demand will play a role like it has in every other truly revolutionary medical uh, advance. And the second thing that will happen is that um, scientists and physician scientists will become more interested in trying other things. Right. Uh, because it'll be an opportunity to learn, an opportunity. And, and it's really important to point out there's a tremendous interest right now in the vagus nerve pathways and in the vagus nerve mechanisms because we've learned so much in the past 25 years. But we've, my colleagues and I, Sangeeta Shivan in the lab at Feinstein and our other colleagues, we've always said from, from the beginning, this is the tip of the iceberg. Right. You know, there's 100,000 vagus nerve fibers on each side of your neck. This is the entire rest of the autonomic nervous system, which includes the fight or flight sympathetic yep. chains. Nearly every cell in your body is innervated. Mm -hmm. There are dozens and dozens of neurotransmitters yep. that are gated through hundreds, if not millions of neural networks. Mm -hmm. The more we learn about this and apply what we learn to specific questions in immunology, the faster we'll get to new therapies. Right. So you, you just mentioned the neck and uh, the opportunities for more clinical trials. Do you think, you know, transcutaneous devices have a, a future? You know, there's still sort of mixed feelings and appetite from, you know, the consumer public with, uh, about surgeries, right? So, so where do these non-invasive approaches? Yeah, fall? you you use two very important words okay. that are actually very different: transcutaneous and non-invasive. Okay. And 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 the, and I'm yeah. glad you did. Okay. Because that 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 has to be. That's how you have to start your thinking through about this problem. So the first thing is, is is it um, is it a in the case of the vagus nerve? Just keep this specific. Is 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 the non-invasive device a specific vagus nerve stimulator? Mm -hmm. That's the first question if you're approaching this from a scientific um, basis. Um, does the non-invasive device stimulate? Currently, the only non-invasive device that um, can be proved to stimulate the vagus nerve is focused ultrasound. Right. Um, and there's ways of doing that in the liver, in the port of hepatis. There's ways of doing that um, potentially in the neck. And so, you, so I, I, I call, or I refer to, I describe uh, focused ultrasound as, as a non-invasive vagus nerve stimulator when done in the, in, in the, proper, right. with the, in the proper hands with the proper knowledge. Yeah. The other devices that are essentially TENS units, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulating units, mm -hmm. they're applying electricity to the skin. Right. And you can put it on your neck or you can put it yeah. in your ear. So these are the things you can find on Amazon right now. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of yeah. people use them to, to, yeah. to, to significant therapeutic benefit. And some yeah. of them are FDA approved. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I don't have any quarrel yeah. with clinical data done again, as we said before, in a rigorous way, supporting the use of some of these devices for some conditions. Right. I disagree with calling them vagus nerve stimulators. Right. So, you know, FDA approval for a, uh, is based on clinical evidence and safety, uh, not on what the device is called. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's better, much better to refer to TENS units on the neck or TENS units in the ear. Uh, in the ear, you might want to call it a transauricular nerve stimulator okay. or skin stimulator. Yeah. And in the neck, you might want to call it a transcervical um, stimulator of the skin of the neck, but yeah. I wouldn't call it. I wouldn't call them vagus nerve stimulators. There's no evidence. What's What's fascinating in the applying the um, 
the TENS units to the ear, to the external ear, is that there are some very significant clinical results that have been uh, robustly, we, my colleagues and I at the Feinstein have published mm -hmm. some of those. There's some very interesting clinical results. Yeah. And there are some imaging studies suggesting that the ear stimulation with a TENS unit um, actually activates parts of the brain that look like the parts of the brain that are activated by a implantable vagus nerve stimulator. That's interesting, yeah. but it doesn't prove causality. So it's true, true, mm -hmm. we don't know the relationship. Right. So we only have a few seconds left. Maybe you could leave us with the indication that you think we would least expect you think vagus nerve stimulation could be useful for. <laughs> least suspect. Um, well, inflammation, uh, a cancer. Okay. Cancer, because there's already data uh, accumulating. I mean, um, we had a, a conference here a few years ago led by Michelle Mange and oh, I'm going to forget somebody, and I know Dave Tuvison and Jeremy Borninger and others here at Cold Spring Harbor at the Banbury Center. And this was the last meeting most of us went to before COVID. So it was the fall of 2019, and we published a consensus statement in Cell, a consensus article, a mini review that talked about four different mechanistic reasons why pursuing um, vagus nerve stimulation and other nerve stimulation and nerve inhibition strategies is actually very plausible when you think about cancer. So we're very excited about that. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kevin. And Thank you, uh, Ted. My pleasure.